Okay. So I should be live now on YouTube. Hello, my name is Carsten Schrady and I'm a researcher at the CNRS in Strasbourg doing field work in South Africa. And I'm today's host of the um, fine seminar. And before I come to today's um, speakers, I would like to first look back on what we did, what we heard last week. It was a fascinating talk, which was also um, based on fieldwork done in South Africa by Erika van der Waal on doing um, great experiments on cognition in vervet monkeys. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you go to our YouTube channel and, and, and see the talk there. And next week, we're going to um, hear from Dan Rubenstein about behavioral variation and flexibility in some um, um, horses, zebras, and wild, wild asses. Also, a talk I want to mention now because not everybody says until the end of the discussion. So, last week was great. Next week will be great. And this week will be very special because it's a special find that we do not have one and presenter, but I invited three young colleagues from Africa to present us in shorter talks um, their work. These are three young colleagues who I know are doing ec excellent work in different fields of animal behavior related um, to social behavior. We call this the African Young Researchers at the Frontiers of Social Evolution um, seminar. So, and these three young colleagues also have relations to what we heard already before during the fine. My JP is going to talk about naked mole rats. And you might remember the great talk of Markus um, Zettel about um, the Maryland mole rats. I think it was um, in a fine in, in this year in spring. Stan Dive is going to talk about symbiosis in some um, beetles. And we had a similar talk on a similar topic by um, Peter Biedermann also in a previous find. And Saliva is later going to talk about um, bubblers, so some, some very interesting birds. And we also already had a talk by Mandy Ridley about um, cognition, cooperation, and climate change in bubblers. So this um, work of our young colleagues presenting today are, is really also related to the more advanced um, colleagues that were presenting at the find already earlier. So there will be three talks. Um, each um, colleague has 15 minutes. We start with Cepi, then Standive, and at the end, then Selive. And um, they have 15 minutes each. And then I make five minutes discussion for that specific talk. But as not everybody in the audience can stay for the entire two hours that we have scheduled, we will then continue with the next colleague. And at the end, there will still be something like 45 minutes of general discussion where you can ask questions to any of the colleagues. You know that to ask a question in fine, you type a question mark into the chat. And then, we'll, then for the general discussion also ask you to put in brackets the um, first letter of the person you want to ask. So S for Standive, T for CP, and C for Salive. So that these colleagues are a little bit prepared to know, okay, now there's going to be a question for me. And because you know, like all of us that are presenting here, they're also a little bit nervous and it would be nice for them to, to be um, a bit warned that the next question will be addressed to um, this, this person. And we're starting um, with a talk by, by Zepi, who originally comes from Botswana, but who did her, most of her studies at the University of Pretoria, where she is currently doing um, a PhD on naked mole rats that she's going to finish. Um, beginning of next year, and she will be looking for a postdoc from the middle of next year onwards. She has been before she worked on the naked morals where she works in captivity. She worked, um, she's, she's quite a field-based person who loves to be in the field. And before she worked with the African clawless otter and I asked her whether she would prefer to work with a captive system or field work again afterwards with her postdoc. And she said she doesn't care. What's important for her is that it will be an interesting and fascinating question with relation to social behavior and um, some physiology and um, probably some, something like hormones. So she did field work in three different um, areas of South Africa for her master's on this Claudius Otter. And I had two publications coming out of this master thesis before she then continued to work in Pretoria um, with the naked mole rats. So she, after she graduated in Pretoria, she, she kept on staying and there to work um, in the group of Nigel Bennett. And she is not only working um, scientifically productive by writing scientific papers, but she also had, um, I think it was this year, uh, some broadcast on a YouTube channel that was called Claws and Paws, where they are talking together with one of her colleagues. Uh, I think his name is Bruce, that we also see here. They graduated together 
a good friend of Glass and Paws, where they bring um, about fieldwork and zoology, um, the ideas and what's interesting to a broader audience. And it's some very interesting topics that they are discussing there. So if you're interested to um, hear something about zoology less than um, academically, but more for broad audience, you can also look up on, on YouTube for this channel, Glass and Paws. I, I watched all these episodes and all of them are interesting and entertaining. And I also learned something. So with this, I'm coming um, to introduce um, Zepi, and she is now going to present her talk on aggression, boldness, exploration, personality traits in the subterranean naked mole rats, this persomorph. And um, I forgot we were supposed to um, check the sharing of the screen works well, but it always worked well. And so I would like Zepi to share her screen and give her presentation and it should work good. Yes, I can see it very well, Sydney. Hi, everyone. Um, podcast, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised that you watched the podcast. And yeah, um, OK, <laughs> let's get started. Um, sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm going to give a quick brief summary of my academic background. Um, I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Botswana, the land where there are more cows than people. Um, at the university, I had a biology major where I focused on zoological sub subjects and a mathematics minor where I focused on statistics and modeling. And then I moved to the University of Pretoria in 2017, where I got my Honors, um, I worked on the incredible data set on southern elephant, seal, uh, southern elephant seals through the marine, marine, Marian Island Marine Mammal Program. Um, here we used long term data sets on movement and on movement data of the animals, um, and we tested whether there was a relationship between environmental variables such as sea surface temperature and chlorophyll air concentrations and behavioral correlates such as foraging site fidelity and, um, and home range. And then um, as Prof. Kasten mentioned, I, in 2019, I did my master's in um, African tallest otters through the Mammal Research Institute. The project had a two-pronged approach where we first looked at African tallest otters in, and their stress-related correlates in an anthropogenic area and a pristine area. And the second part of that two-pronged approach is that we looked at camera trap data and investigated if there are differences in otter behavior between the two areas. Um, it was at this point I realized I do have a love for endocrine endocrinology and behavior, and I started my PhD on naked morats, which I'm about to finish, hopefully. Um, and we were looking up, we are looking at behavior, stress related and reproductive endocrine correlates in the youth social naked morats. So that takes me to our naked morats. Um, they are one of the two mammal species that are regarded as youth social. However, the definition of youth social is heavily debated, but what we consider youth social here is that there is division of labor, overlap in generations, cooperative care of young, as well as, um, yeah, division of labor, overlap in generations, and cooperative care of young. So in naked morat communities, we have, um, they can live up to, they can have, they can live in colonies of up to 80 individuals, where first we have the queen, this is the breeding female, and there are one to three breeding males, and the rest are non-reproductive um, subordinates. With the non-reproductive subordinates, three behavioral phenotypes have been described. The first are the workers. These are non-aggressive and non-explorative individuals which perform tasks such as colony maintenance. Then we have the soldiers, which are linked to colony defense, and they are determined by their regressive behavior towards foreign individuals. Lastly, we have the morphologically distinct dispersal morph, which is linked to exploratory behavior of colony openings, and they persist persistently attempt to disperse. So since animal personality plays such an important role, um, such an important role in the different in the different behavioral phenotypes, we aim to establish a method to quantify animal personality traits in this species. We designed um, an, a tunnel system, a novel tunnel system, in order to 
um, quantify these animal personality traits, and we focus specifically on the dispersomorphs. The reason why we focused on the dispersomorphs is just it's mainly because they don't have any time constraints on how much time they can be away from the colony. Um, previous research suggests that they're the ones who are most likely to exhibit explorative and bold behaviors and to a small extent aggressive behaviors. Um, so first, we defined animal personality as consistent differences among individuals in behavior across time, situation, and both. For the scope of the study, we considered the scale between exploration, the propensity to be active and collect information in a novel situation, and avoidance, propensity to avoid a novel situation, Boldness, propensity to respond to a situation which potentially threatens survival, and shyness, propensity to avoid a situation which <laughs> potentially threatens survival. And then finally, we looked at aggressiveness, potential to, dis to exhibit antagonistic behaviors towards conspecifics, and docile, propensity to exhibit submissive, submissive behaviors towards conspecifics. Um, we had 12 individuals um, and each were introduced to a closed off acclimation pod and our tunnel system included a control pod and a novel pod. In the control pod, they had nesting, nesting material from the original enclosure, so it smelled like them and, novel, and the novel pod was completely empty, no nesting material and it had a foreign smell. So for, our, for the first exploration, we opened the acclimation pod doors and allowed the animal to explore for 15 minutes. Then all the behaviors were recorded and the animal was given 15 minutes to 10, sorry, 10 minutes to, um, to acclimate. And then for our boldness and aggression test, we, in, we, in, we introduced a novel object to the novel pod. This was either a, pred, a piece of snake skin, which is um, from a mole snake, as well as a piece of cotton for the boldness test, as well as a conspecific of, from, the same, from the same sex for the conspecific. Um, then, as with the explorative experiment, once we introduced the novel object, we opened the doors and the animal was allowed to explore for 15 minutes and all behaviors were recorded. As I previously mentioned, we did this for 12 individuals, 6 males and 6 females. For analysis, all the recorded behaviors were converted to a proportion of the total time and we used the principal component analysis, PCA, from here on to the behaviors which were consistent, consistent between individuals as well as between tests. We used the Pearson's correlation to test consistency between the personality assays. Oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention. We repeated the same test um, after one day, three days, five days, and seven days. So the animal, one individual went through the same test five times. Um, we used the Pearson's correlation test to test the consistency between the different tests. And finally, we use the linear mixed effect model um, with ID as a mixed as a random effect to test if there were differences between the sexes. Um, cool, so results. First, I'll take your attention to the graph on top where we have our weight on our y-axis and individual on our x-axis. The first thing we saw that weight had no, had no significant relationship with any of the behavioral, um, um, behavioral tests that we did. This is aggression, exploration, and boldness. Um, and this is contrary to what literature says with regards to naked monads because the larger individuals are the ones that are expected to be more aggressive, but that's not what we got. Um, and with the graph below, we have our aggression test. So the way our PCA loadings, um, the results of our PCA loadings, individuals with a PCA score of less than zero was considered repressive, and um, PCAs greater than zero were considered docile individuals. Um, we did see consistency in behavior between the first essay, the one day after, three days after, and five days after. However, on the seven days, the there was no correlation between the first day and the seventh day. We suspect this was because the animals were now habituated after the fifth repetition to the conspecific of the same sex. However, all in all, we did get consistent, consistent behaviors between, um, across time as well as differences between individuals. 
with our boldness, um, same thing with our aggression, PCA values below zero were considered bold individuals, and PCA values above zero were considered shy individuals. Here, um, there was no significant uh, difference between the results from our snake skin as well as our as uh, as well as our cotton as our cotton and we suspect that's because the animals did perceive both as a threat to its survival um the the responses to the to the cotton or the snake skin were consi were consistent with all the repetitions and there were consistent differences between individual between the individuals um with exploration again um PCA values before zero were the exploitative individuals and PCA values above zero were the avoided individuals. And we did get consistency between the days. So there was consistency in time and there were consistent differences between individuals. So we, we are seeing personality traits in naked more at dispersomorphs. Um, a happy accident, <laughs> I call it a happy accident, that we got is that we got three disturbances, three responses to disturbance behaviors were reported during the boldness and exploration test. First is, um, is the avoidance behavior, um, where the animal avoids the stimulus completely. Then we have the confront behavior, where the animal directly confronts the disturbance. And we have the barricade behavior, which is observed for the first time in the naked monads, which is potentially unique to subterranean mammals, where the animal attempts to separate or block access to the disturbance. So we, we looked at these behaviors and quantified them and put them against the, um, um, the PCA values during our bold and exploration test. Again, I'll mention that PCA values less than zero are more uh, our bold and explorative individuals and PCA values above zero are, uh, uh, are, are our shy and avoidant individuals. So what we immediate, what we saw is that there was a positive and negative correlation between our attack behavior and our PCA values. What this shows is that our bold individuals or our exploration individuals are more likely to confront the disturbance or the threat to survival as opposed to our shy and avoidant individuals. We did this with our barrier behavior as well. We saw this time a positive relationship. And what this shows is that our shy individuals and our avoidant individuals are more likely to try and create a barricade between them and the stressor as opposed to our bold and explorative individuals. Um, when we looked at this with uh, avoidant behavior, there was a complete mess and there was no correlation between the PCA values and the um, avoidant behavior. We think this is because the animals, um, the bold individuals, because they were the first to attack, um, they quickly figured out that this was not a threat to survival and continued to explore the rest of the tunnel system, whereas our shy individuals did not enter. And thus, the way our data, the picture the data creates is that all the individuals now spend equal amount of time away from the stressor. So um, all in all, uh, what we've seen is that we have a novel tunnel system that is a really good potential tools for kind of quantifying animal personality in subterranean mammals. It worked with our naked mole rat dispersers. However, um, this there is a limitation out in this current method because there is a time constraint on how long you can separate individuals from their natal colony. Um, but we do know for sure that, well, not for sure, but we do know that the animal personality traits are present in naked more at dispersomorphs. And we have seen barrier behavior as a potential response to disturbance in the species. It would be really interesting to see now if this barrier behavior is linked to um, work tasks within the colony. Um, as I'd mentioned with my future plans, and as Prof. Shaden mentioned, um, I really have a passion for behavioral endocrinology. It is the hill that I've decided to die on. And thank you all for your attention, as well as thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present some of their work. Thank you.
Yes, thank you very much, JP. Very interesting um, presentation and system. And we have a question by Eduardo. Thank you, JP. Lovely, fantastic system. And this is a very, very simple question to refresh my natural history knowledge of the naked mole rats. So it, what makes an animal a dispersal? Can you predict that they will become dispersers? How are, is, it, is it the size, the weight? You may have said this and I missed it, but what makes an animal how do you recognize a disperser? Um, so the disperser moths usually have um, morphological traits. Um, they have more fat reserves compared to the, to the rest of the colony members. Um, it has been um, suggested that this is because they need the fat reserves for when they disperse. Um, we identify dispersers in our lab through persistency and when, in terms of frequency of escape attempts. Um, and that's how we identify the dispersers. Yeah, they're thought to be the one with the genetic um, impulse to go and spread the genes. Thank you. Thank you. Then a question by Clara. All right, uh, thank you for the talk. First of all, um, I want to point out to everybody that a critical, this was left out at the beginning, a critical criterion diagnostically for our eusocial animal to be classified eusocial is reproductive division of labor. And this distinguishes Com in, in some approaches, this distinguishes complex sociality from the sociality grade, which is classified as uh, cooperative. So if you sociality uh, evolves from cooperation and that's not inevitable, um, the transition from cooperation to complex sociality would have to demonstrate the, the diagnostic trait, reproductive division of labor, which means we have breeders and helpers. And that is one of the remarkable things about you sociality in mammals. And I think naked mole rats are the only ones demonstrating a morphological cast but this makes them similar to uh, the social insect use social grade. And that's one reason that they are of great interest to us. Now, my question is um, focusing on the morphological quote unquote cast, technically cast, uh, which I think is unique in mammals. Um, how do you relate the exploratory behavior to their specialization as, um, uh, oh, sorry, to their specialization as dispersers? Are they more exploratory than non-dispersers? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so one, there are different methods in identifying dispersers. Um, one of the methods is the um, explorative, explorative behaviors of colony openings. So yes, in theory, the dispersers should be more explorative compared to the rest of the colony members. It would be really, really cool to be able to do um, an explorative test with an explorative test with um, dispersers and the rest of the members of the colony. Because as you were seeing in my results, it is a spectrum. It's not. Um, it's not categorical. It's continuous. So my suspicion would be then that dispersers would be at the explorative end of the. Of the of the spec yeah at the at the explorative end of the spectrum compared to non dispersers 
but uh, for test, including non-dispersers would be needed to confirm that. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we have now one more question by Leticia, and then we continue with the next talk, but you can still ask more questions to Zepi at the very end of the yeah. time. Thank you for that very interesting talk. Lek and Morabts are super interesting. So my question has to do again with the disperser morphs. I guess if it is a continuum, I was going to ask, and now it's not clear whether this is a good question or not. Like what proportion of the uh, workers would be considered dispersers and whether that changes, like are there phases in the life cycle of colonies when the disperser morph may become more common? Um, in terms of proportion of dispersers and compared to the rest of the colony, I can't give an exact value, but I would say they are more rare compared to the other behavioral phenotypes. Um, there are different reasons put forward for the occurrence of dispersers. Usually is, um, I think the one with that's commonly used to explain is the size of the colony. So if the colony gets too big, usually that's when we have um, dispersers occurring. Um, like I said, uh, dispersers are a bit, there is a bit of a debate because then it brings in the question of the breeding as well as inbreeding in the naked morads and dispersers are thought as thought of as an evolutionary mechanism to increase genetic dis, uh, gen genetic diversity between naked morad colonies. So yeah, I can't give a solid answer yet, <laughs> but I think further research is needed to try and establish mechanisms such as those. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Zepi. Yeah, there's still lots to, to learn from and about naked morads. Uh, and we, I'm continuing now. So our next talk today will be by Stan Vive, um, who is um, going to talk about um, particular enhancing symbionts for durable armor in um, grain pest beetles. I met um, Stan Vive in 2017 when she was actually doing a master thesis with us um, at a research station in South Africa. And I have to say that she has been one of the most gifted and most intelligent students I ever have worked with. I remember the first time I met her was via Skype. It was long before Corona, one still used Skype. And we talked a few months before she came to the station and discussed everything. And I asked if everything is clear and she said, yes. And I didn't hear anything from her. And I met her three, four months later at the station. And normally students are normal humans and you tell them something and half of, half of it is forgotten if at all. But when I met her there several months later, she had remembered everything. She had taken everything into account and she had understood everything. And that was for me really amazing. If you have supervised students or even colleagues or even myself, you know that normal people are not that, that, that quick with, with grasping everything. And I guess typical for a very gifted student, she didn't even realize um, that, that she has um, this, this very strong intellectual skill. I would have said she might have been one of maybe even the best student I ever had if she would not have unfortunately decided after she worked with us to, to leave the project and do her PhD somewhere else. But maybe that was also um, a good decision because after she graduated at WITS, she then later went to Germany, first to the University of Mainz and then with her supervisor from there, um, moved to the Max Planck Institute in Jena, one of the best um, um, scientific institutions in Germany, where she is now working and doing her PhD on symbiosis and symbionts in these um, um, grain beetles she's going to talk to us about today. She already gave a talk just in July at a much um, more posh um, environment than the fine here at the International Symbiosis Society Congress in Lyon in France. And there she won um, the prize as the best um, PhD student presenter uh, at a very nice and important symposium. So I'm very happy that she still agreed to even come here to um, the not so, so posh fine to present to us today about um, critical enhancing symbionts for durable armor, how nutritional symbionts Enhance protection against natural enemies in a grain 
pest um, species. Okay, if you can share your screen and stand Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Karsten. Um, I have to say, it, it just sounded like you're talking about someone else. <laughs> the, uh, does not feel that way to me of just uh, trying to do the best science that I can possibly do. But thank you so much. That was a humbling um, introduction. So uh, today I'll be talking to you about nutritional symbionts um, and how these can enhance the defense of a grain pest beetle against a predator and a pathogen, but also confer desiccation resistance. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, how does this go? Okay, it wants to do that. Just to give you a bit of background on my academic journey, I started uh, at the University of the Free State uh, with the BSc and thereafter did my honors uh, with a project that was in ecotoxicology. And here what we did was um, investigate the potential use of biochar as uh, an alleviant to heavy metal contamination to soil invertebrates. And thereafter I moved to Wits University and I was really lucky to be supervised by Karsten and Neville, um, patient and very encouraging supervisors, I have to say. And here I worked on the behavioral ecology of bachelor male groups uh, in the African striped mice. And thereafter, I worked for a year as a lab technician at the Durban University of Technology before coming to Germany, um, where I'm now at the MPI for chemical ecology, working on these grain pest beetles, some of the research that I will be talking about today. So to get right into it, insects are some of the most diverse, one of the most diverse um, animal groups, and this diversity can be linked to the remarkable adaptations that range from morphological, physiological, behavioral, but also one adaptation that has allowed insects to basically extend the metabolic capability and therefore uh, their adaptive potential is forming these associations or relationships with microbes. And one particular way that um, these symbioses can be classified is that we look at what the microbes are doing for the insect host. So in mutualistic symbiotic associations, you have this two-way interaction where the microbes do something for the host and in return, they are housed by the insect host. And indeed, we classify them depending on this categorization of what the microbes are doing. And in defensive symbiosis, you find that usually the microbial partner is producing some kind of bioactive secondary metabolites that can have toxic or deterrent functions. And this is the case, for example, in bee wolves and in Lagria, where the symbionts are producing concoction of antibiotics that defend the developmental stages against pathogenic infection. On the other hand, we study nutritional symbioses. And in these cases, the symbionts are provisioning um, or supplementing the host diets with aromatic amino acids or vitamins that could be deficient in the diets. And this is the case in the aphid Buchnera symbiosis, for example, where the symbionts are supplementing the very nutritionally poor plant sap diet. Within these um, cuticle enhancing symbioses have now emerged in several beetle families. So we found them in the uh, bostrichids, in the sylvanids, the thrusids, as well as in several weevils. And what they have in common is that the symbionts provide precursors for aromatic amino acids via the shikimate pathway. And this is especially important for beetles because animals are not able to synthesize aromatic amino acids themselves. So they should be either getting this from a diet or they can partner with a microbe that can do this. And in these beetles, this is exactly what is happening. The symbionts are housed intracellularly, they do the shikimate pathway and they deliver the aromatic amino acid. And one, particularly important amino acid is the tyrosine that is actually involved in cuticle biosynthesis, namely in the process of sclerotization that is cross-linking the cuticle and making it rigid and harder over time, as well as depositing melanin in the melanization process that makes the cuticle darker. And this is very well for the beetle because the insect cuticle is one of the first lines of defense against predators of the same scale in the environment against pathogens, such as fungal entomal pathogens that have to infect via the cuticle, as well as against um, heat and drought related stresses. And so at the core of my PhD, I'm trying to understand how do these tyrosine supplementing symbioses mediate the host ecological interactions. And this work is then broken down, I tackle this question in several aspects. First, I look at 
um, the role of the symbiosis in predator and pathogen defense, in drought resistance, in intraspecific competition, as well as looking at a herbicide, um, uh, a herbicide impact on the shikimate pathway that then affects the gut microbiota. But today I'll be focusing on uh, these two aspects, um, predator and pathogen defense, as well as drought resistance. So the first question I ask is, what is this amount impact on defense against predation in Orise philisterina mensis? So I introduce you to Orise philisterina mensis. This is a cosmopolitan pest of stored grain products. Um, it houses bacterial symbionts of the group bacteroidetes, and these are found in both the adults as well as the larval stages. We are able to manipulate the symbiosis and remove the symbionts. And what had been previously shown is that if you remove the symbionts, you disturb cuticle formation. So beetles that emerge without the symbiotic, uh, the symbionts, which are the ones we call the aposymbiotic beetles, they emerge lighter and they also emerge with uh, a thinner cuticle. And so one of the first things that I tried to understand is what exactly is symbiont contribution to cuticle development? So when the beetle moves from being uh, a pupa to being an, an adult, through this process of having to develop the cuticle, how are the symbionts contributing? So I studied this with two proxies. The first was melanization. So here you're looking at the melanization progression of aposymbiotic beetles from days one to three to symbiotic beetles from days one, uh, days one to seven, sorry. And we could see just from the pictures that the symbiotic beetles are able to melanize at a much faster rate. And when we quantified this, what you're looking at here is the quantification on the y-axis of these differently aged beetles. We could see that the symbiotic beetles are able to rapidly increase the, the darkness of the cuticle when we compare them to these aposymbiotic beetles in the white contours. And so we then looked at the second proxy for cuticle development, looking at cuticle thickness. And for this, I did sections of the thorax of um, these differently aged beetles, and then used microscopy to look at the thickness of the cuticle and compare this across the different treatments of different ages. And when we quantified this, we could see that um, the thickness of the cuticle, as you see on the y-axis of the differently aged beetles, uh, increases rapidly again for the symbiotic beetles in the gray contours, but not so much for these aposymbiotic beetles, which are never really able to, to catch up. And so what we could show here is that symbionts accelerate develop, uh, cuticle development post pupil eclosion. And thereafter, I asked the question, how does this differential rate at which the cuticle develop impact a beetle's ability to defend itself against a predator that has to actively penetrate the cuticle for successful predation? And so I did predation essays um, with uh, wolf spiders, genderless predators that also have to actively penetrate the cuticle to inject the venom um, that uh, allows for successful predation. And so the essay started off with acclimation steps with the spiders and the beetles separated. Uh, and thereafter the separation was removed and I was able to observe the interaction. And here I was able to measure then the survival of the symbiotic and aposymbiotic beetles that were differently aged. But I also conducted these essays for the larvae because we also knew from uh, previous work that there is a difference in the thickness of the cuticle even at the larval stage. And here I was able to do these essays but measure spider handling times. So the time taken from uh, the point of capture until the end of feeding. And what you're looking at here is the survival probability of differently aged beetles that were symbiotic or aposymbiotic. And what we could see is that survival probability increases with an increase in age for both symbiotic and aposymbiotic beetles. But if we look closely and see, for example, how long it takes to reach a 50% survival probability, we see that this is happening at a much earlier um, time point for the symbiotic beetles than it is for the aposymbiotic beetles. And so we wanted to expand this work to now see what happens in a situation where there is um, a beetle that is being eaten and how long would the spider then take to handle such a beetle. And we see here the spider handling times on the y-axis of the symbiotic and the aposymbiotic beetles. And we could see significant differences, which were uh, averaging out about 14 minutes of a difference in spider handling times between symbiotic and aposymbiotic beetles. And next, again, we then expand this work to see what happens with an entomal pathogen that has to actively penetrate the cuticle before being able to replicate in the hemolymph of the insect. 
And one such pathogen that is known to do this is Bovaria bassiana, which is also a genderless uh, entomopathogenic fungus. And so I exposed beetles to these Bovaria bassiana spores. And they were in groups of about 15 per replicate. Um, and I exposed them for a period of two weeks. And during this time, I was then able to measure survival and remove the dead individuals to observe for post-mortem mycelial growth to see if they had indeed died of the fungal infection. And what you're looking at here is the survival probability of the beetles uh, over the exposure period of 14 days. And again, you could see here that in the solid lines, these are the old beetles were, that had a significantly higher survival rate than the young beetles. But in particular, in this dashed line, you see that the survival probability of the aposymbiotic beetles was the lowest. And so to summarize this part, we could show that the symbionts accelerate cuticle development. So when beetles emerge from the pupil case, they have a white and soft cuticle, and they have to make the crucial transition to a cuticle that is um, hard and dark. And the presence of the symbionts actually accelerates this process. And therefore, it reduces predation and um, fungal infection in those crucial stages by allowing these symbiotic beetles to escape faster from a period of vulnerability while they are still building up their cuticle. Um, and so what we show here is a nutritional enhancement of structural defenses, uh, which is unlike the traditional defensive symbiosis in that there is no chemical metabolite that's being produced by the symbionts, but that this nutrition that is being supplemented then helps the beetle to um, overcome its natural enemies. And so with this work, we had now previously also been able to show that in the same beetle, um, the symbiosis confers desiccation resistance. And so what has been an interesting point is to try and see if these symbioses in these different beetles that have this cuticle enhancement are, fun or are ecologically similar. So I wanted to then test symbiont impact on desiccation resistance in a different beetle now, that is Cytophilus orase. So this is also another pest of stored grain. And they have a symbiotic relationship with Sodalis perantonius bacteria that are also housed in, intracellularly. And the previous work here had also shown that um, if you remove the symbionts, you basically um, perturb cuticle development in that the aposymbiotic individuals have a lighter cuticle, but also they are, uh, have a thinner cuticle. And this relates well to desiccation in insects because um, insects lose water in a variety of ways, but because the cuticle is skin and exoskeleton, it covers the entire surface of the body. Transcuticular water loss is one of the major ways that insects can lose water. And so um, the structural integrity of the cuticle itself will matter for water conservation. But in addition to this, insects are known to apply a layer of hydrocarbons or, or waxy layer on the surface of the cuticle that serves a waterproofing function. And so I wanted to understand, do the symbionts mediate resistance to desiccation in this species? And so for that, I exposed symbiotic and aposymbiotic beetles to low humidity as well as high humidity over a period of three months. After those three months, I could remove the adults um, and then I could freeze the beetles that would emerge for later extraction of these particular hydrocarbons to see what is the physiological response um, of these beetles when exposed to desiccation, but I could also assess population growth at this point um, and look at the long-term fitness effect of the symbiosis when, it, uh, when the beetles are exposed to, um, to desiccation stress. And what you're looking at here is the population growth of these beetles after a period of three months. And we could see a significant humidity uh, and symbiont status effect, but what was even more interesting is this interaction effect between uh, humidity and symbiosis. And what this indicates is that the absence of the symbionts is particularly bad for uh, population growth under conditions of desiccation stress. And so we could show here that the symbiosis is beneficial under chronic desiccation stress for these beetles. And thereafter, I wanted to understand, try to go in the direction of the wise. Um, and since insect size matters for water balance when we take surface area to volume considerations, um, I measured the weight of the beetles. So what you're looking at here is the wet weight of the aposymbiotic beetles and the symbiotic beetles. We could see that the symbiotic beetles have a higher wet weight. And thereafter, I dried the beetles to obtain the dry weight. 
and the somatic B cells also have a higher dry weight. And if you search for this difference, which is this water loss process, you can then use this as a proxy for body water content. So the difference then I could show here um, that the symbiotic beetles have a higher body water content than the apple symbiotic beetles. But I guess this is to be expected if they have a, a higher body size. And so what was even more interesting is looking at the proportional change in water content. So while the symbiotic beetles have a higher body water content, apple symbiotic beetles are losing more water proportionally. And so the symbiotic beetles at this point, we could show that they have a higher body water content, but tend to lose water at a slower rate. And so the next question naturally is to try to understand why this is happening. Is it by way of the cuticular hydrocarbons or is, is there a different mechanism um, explaining this? And so I did a chemical analysis of the hydrocarbons. I was able to identify over 20 hydrocarbons um, in Cytophilus oryzae that is a mixture of both alkanes and alkenes. And so the first analysis was to try and understand does the profile or the composition of these beetles change when they are exposed to desiccation or does it change as a function of symbiotic status? And here we could not see this. So there does not seem to be a grouping or clustering of the hydrocarbons according to humidity or status. And so long-term desiccation stress does not seem to be affecting uh, the cuticular hydrocarbon profile. And so to summarize this, part that is still ongoing is that there's a similar benefit under long-term desiccation stress, and that is, is clear from our long-term desiccation stress experiment. Um, the benefit is likely mediated by, symbiont, by a symbiont enhanced cuticle, and I uh, hypothesized this because I could not see this physiological response by way of the CHCs, but it's likely that uh, the cuticle is mediating this, that they are losing water at a slower rate because there's just they have a more structurally intact cuticle than they would in the absence of the symbionts. And so what we show now is that there is an, uh, a similarity of ecological function in two separate species um, of beetles that have uh, a cuticle enhancing symbiosis. And so to come to uh, the last part, we posit that engaging in this cuticle enhancing symbiosis or this relationship with the microbes that um, improve the quality of the cuticle allows for a multifunctional armor that can defend the insect against predators, against pathogens, as well as um, abiotic stresses that are humidity related in the case of these experiments. And given that these symbioses have now emerged in several beetle families, and I will add also in ants, this is likely a way that insects use uh, to cope and adapt to the ever-changing environment. And so with that, I come to the end of my talk today. Um, I would like to thank the, uh, my supervisors, Martin and Toby, and the entire Department of Insect Symbiosis that just makes the atmosphere at the Institute so amazing to work in, um, and the conversations and just bouncing off ideas. And also to thank um, Karsten for, and the organizers for inviting me here today. It's my first invited talk. So I, I think that's a really big deal. <laughs> Um, and I'm so grateful to have been able to present my work here and thank you all for listening today and yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'm <clears throat> Sandhya, really great um, talk and great um, experiments and, and you have been doing with, with these, these um, different um, species of, of beetles. Um, let me see. Where are we? Okay, there is a question by Eduardo. But, but I'll be happy to defer to those who did not get to ask questions before, so you can skip me now. We have three questions at the moment, it should be good. Okay, so uh, my question is fascinating, fascinating research you're doing. Uh, I was well aware, for example, of the importance of pheromones in all kinds of, of, of behavior uh, related to insects and invertebrates. What I didn't know as we discuss or, or I read and try to understand the role that pheromones may play in things like nature or aggression is that in trying to understand the mechanisms regulating the production of pheromones, now we may need to look at the symbionts as well. So have you, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like you're doing it, but 
uh, am I right in saying that it is possible that symbionts ought also to be considered in relationship to mate choice mechanisms when insects are assessing each other through assessing the cuticle of their partner? Now the, the symbiont can completely change that cuticle in relationship to what the male or the female assess. Am I right? Yes. Um, so I think that's actually a very interesting thing that I, when whenever I think about it, like trying to maintain the first question that comes to mind is trying to maintain um, a hydrocarbon profile or pheromones that are beneficial for maybe species recognition or mating, um, or even cast differences. They find that they, these play a role in, in in social insects, for example. But then balancing this out with having the perfect profile that can buffer you against desiccation. So this is also like a really interesting thing. But um, when coming to the role of the symbionts in adjusting this, um, the first thing that I would say is that the pheromones themselves are a subdivision of the hydrocarbon. So they can be modified um, to form the pheromones. And because of this, the depending on what the uh, symbionts is doing. So for example, if a symbionts is provisioning a nutrient that then goes into this pathway of producing these, and if you remove the symbionts uh, with so, uh, something that cannot produce this, then you affect the production of the pheromone that would be important later on for communication or for something like this. But what is also a very interesting way uh, um, that symbionts can affect um, reproductive choice, if I should put it that way, is that they can also, for example, have Volbachia, which is a sex manipulator symbiont that is found across various, um, in fact, I think the, the infection is over 70% or so of insects are infected with this Volbachia. And what they show is that this can influence um, uh, the compatibility of uh, sperm and egg. Um, they also show that um, it can also male kill in some species. So symbionts do play a role in, in these um, type of interactions. So yeah, I think there's various ways, either from a nutritional aspect or just by directly manipulating uh, the sexuality or the sex ratio in, in a species. Fascinating, fascinating, thank you. Yes, it's amazing what, what's happening there. And we have a question by Clara. I'll wait if you want me to. Oh, just ask your question, otherwise I wouldn't call you up. Okay, um, since we're here for social evolution, which usually occurs at the population level, and you're talking about symbiosis, which is uh, community ecology at the species species level, I just wanted to very quickly point out to people who are social biologists that the analogy here is that in symbiosis, we have a positive, positive relationship in which both species benefit. In social biology, the positive, positive relationship is cooperation. And one more thing, um, the analogy also is that many people do talk about symbioses when we're talking about social biology at the individual, individual level, um, and that uh, many individual, individual positive interactions um, could be um, uh, identified. Most of us study at one level or at one time or another cooperation. So um, thank you for the talk, it's very interesting. Um, in terms of this symbiosis, um, in the field, do you ever get interference competition from other species that interrupt the uh, symbiosis? Um, do you mean interference from bacterial species? That stop this turn, that turn off the positive effects for one species by a third species. Yeah. Um, so this is more, so 
I, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this, but these bacteria are housed intracellularly. So they are compartmentalized within the, um, the beetle, therefore being host, hosted in a tissue that basically protects them from um, mediation by either the immune host, uh, the host immune system, or even other bacterial players that might be there. But I think in the direction of uh, this question, other beetles or other systems where the symbiosis is in the guts, for example, and there's more than one player, it's been shown that these interactions actually matter. For example, there could be competitive exclusion uh, of the bacteria themselves within the gut. Um, uh, they are morphological adaptations from the host itself that try to exclude or limit who can colonize the gut. So in the case of these types of symbioses, yes, external players can come in and sort of um, interfere with the dynamic or the, the stability of the association. But in this case, since the bacteria are housed intracellularly, um, this is not so much the case because they just compartmentalize and they don't really escape from these tissues. Okay, it's we learn more and more interesting, fascinating things. It's it's amazing. Uh, then we have a question by Tammy, please. Hi, uh, very fascinating talk. I'm just wondering whether if the uh, uh, how do the beetles acquire their symbionts? Is it by nutrition or is it transgenerational? Yeah. Okay. So in this case, the symbionts are vertically transmitted, so from mother to offspring. Um, they are transmitted with the egg. So when it develops, they are already intracellular at that point. Cool, thank you. Thank you, thanks. Thank you. Then we come to the third talk of um, this, this day by, by Salibe, who is based at the University of Cape Town. I tried to uh, get some diversity into um, to, the, the talks today, you see, we have three very different topics, and I, all of them, all of these three young colleagues are kind of related um, to South Africa, but um, at least are from three different countries: Sepi originating from Botswana, Standive from South Africa, and Selive is from Eswatini, a country that was formerly called called Swaziland. And Selive is also a little bit further in her career. She be, got a position, permanent position as lecturer at the University of Cape Town. Um, um, a bit less than, than, than one year ago. And um, I don't know her as well as, as the other ones, but one thing that is uh, very clear is when you look um, for Selive in the internet, you never find her alone. She <laughs> seems to be a very sociable person because she always has a bird in her hand. <laughs> that is she that she is manipulating in some way to take some, some samples and to do her ecophysiological research and was trying to understand how birds um, can um, cope with harsh environments in Southern Africa, um, especially, especially with droughts. And she's working on this topic and she is a quite experienced ecophysiologist, but she's also still looking to have more international or national collaborations for people working on the same kind of questions like what she's now building up as her um, research lab at the university. Um, of Cape Town. So I'm looking very much forward to um, the last talk now of today by Saliva about hot bubblers quantifying glucocorticoid responses to high temperatures. I've lost it. There we go. We. Um, is it, hello, is it showing in PowerPoint presentation? No, um, we, we see okay. it in, now, it, now, it's, now it's good, now it's perfect. <laughs> okay, thank right. you so much for the introduction. I would also like to thank you and the rest of the organizing committee for inviting me and my fellow presenters um, to share our research. I would also like to thank each and every one of you for staying and listening to me talk about hot bubblers. But before we get to the bubblers, let's talk a little bit about me. So as already mentioned, I am a lecturer at the University of um, Cape Town. My scientific career started in 2006 when I started um, my undergraduate degree in biological sciences and chemistry at the University of Swaziland. Here I did my fourth year project on the potential of 
uh, insectivorous pets as agricultural control agents. And then I went on to do an honors degree at, the at Rhodes University, where I did two um, research projects, one on bats and one on birds. I'm sure you are noticing that there's a trend there somewhere. And then um, for my master's, which I did at the University of Pretoria, I worked on the foraging behavior of white-bellied sunbirds, which you can read about in a paper that we published in the Journal of Ornithology in 2018. I then enrolled for a PhD at the University of Pretoria, where I worked on avian stress responses to some of the activities involved in research. From this, I have published one manuscript, which is what I'll be talking about today, and then I've submitted another one of my chapters for submission, um, while I work on the remaining two chapters to submit for publication later in the year. So my current research uh, interests are related to my PhD work in that I'm still interested in stress physiology. Now I'm interested in stress physiology and its applications to our changing environment, specifically um, the role of hormones as response mechanisms to urbanization and climate change. So the project I'm presenting today would not have been possible without the contributions of my collaborators, my PhD supervisors, as well as my students, Emma and Desedi, whose work I'll be talking about in a bit, well, former students. Um, okay, so for a bit of background information, we all know that air temperatures and rainfall patterns are changing as a result of climate change, with Southern Africa predicted to become hotter and drier as a result. This, of course, is a threat to biodiversity, particularly when we um, consider the fact that um, heat waves are predicted to um, increase in intensity, frequency, and duration. Um, birds, particularly desert birds, which spend, uh, which already inhabit a um, harsh environment are highly vulnerable to the effects of global heating. One, because of their small body size, so they are able to take up heat quite quickly, but also because of their primarily diurnal habits, which have them active at the hottest parts of the day. So we are seeing the consequences of this in the increased um, occurrence of mass mortality events involving birds and bats. So one such event occurred in South Africa in November of 2020. So this is a map of South Africa and this is the KwaZulu Natal province where this happened. So um, about 47 birds belonging to 14 different species died in a matter of hours when air temperatures went above, um, went between 42, sorry, 43 and 45 degrees on a humid day. And this was published by McKechnie and colleagues in 2021. So what this tells us is that there is an urgent need for us as scientists to try and figure out how species are responding to these changes and maybe hopefully find mitigative ways to deal with it. So the species of interest for this study is, the, is a Southern African arid savanna endemic, the Southern Pied Babbler. These are small to medium-sized birds that weigh on average 75 grams, and they are social species in that they breed um, cooperatively, uh, forming groups with one breeding pair and several non-breeding helpers. So, um, these groups will often have between 2 and 12 individuals. You may have met or heard about these species when, when men Ridley gave her presentation in April. So because this is an arid zone species, it is an interesting species to look at to try and see how organisms or how birds specifically are responding to climate change. So we know that these species have behavioral trade-offs between um, between heat dissipating practices and foraging um, practices when it gets too hot. So in this picture here, which is the same picture that we saw on my cover slide, we have two Southern Pied Babblers photographed during a hot day in the Kalahari Desert. And as you can see them, they have their beaks um, gaping because they are panting and trying to get rid of extra heat. And then they also have their wings spread to allow air to pass between their body and their wings, thereby taking some of the heat through convection. So then um, what we see here, so all of these figures um, are going to have Tmax as on the Y, sorry, on the X-axis, where Tmax is the maximum daily air temperature. 
So we see that as Tmax increases, there is an increase in the proportion of time spent dissipating heat, which makes sense when it's too hot, the animal gets too hot and therefore it must offload heat into its environment. However, because one of their main heat dissipating strategies is panting, they then cannot feed. It is mechanically impos impossible to pant and feed at the same time. So what happens is as Tmax increases, there is a decline in foraging efficiency. The birds are not getting as much food as they as they do at low temperatures. So the last figure here um, shows that as Tmax increase, sorry, as Tmax increases, there is going to be a decline in the per percentage of gain in body mass. So um, obviously the temperatures increase, therefore there's an increase in the amount of time spent panting, a decrease in the amount of time spent foraging, and therefore the birds do not gain enough body mass, such that as you approach 40 degrees, you see that the birds actually do not gain any mass over a 24 hour period, which which can have serious consequences when you have several consecutive days where temperatures are, where temperatures are above 40 degrees. So what does this mean for their physiology? So we know that vertebrates, um, including birds, are going to respond to stressful stimuli, including inclement weather, by uh, mounting the vertebrate stress response. This response involves a wide range of behavioral and physiological changes, including but not limited to the increase in circulating glucocorticoids in, the, in circulation. These glucocorticoids are steroid hormones found in the blood and tissues of vertebrates, and at baseline concentrations, they play important roles in physiology, development, behavior, and energy management. At elevated concentrations, these same hormones allow organisms to restore homeostasis and thereby survive stressful stimuli. So we are able to measure um, the, the variation in circulating GC concentrations and therefore use that to quantify stress responses to specific stimuli. The easiest way to do this is to collect a blood sample because there you are just um, you are directly measuring the hormone in the blood. However, collecting a blood sample, particularly for animals like birds, is going to require you to catch the animal, restrain the animal, and then prick it to get to the blood, which of course is going to be stressful in itself. Therefore, um, non-invasive or less invasive methods are preferred. One such method is the use of fecal glucocorticoid metabolites, which, require, which um, requires that we collect dropping samples and then we analyze those samples or we measure FGCM concentrations um, in those, we measure um, metabolite concentrations in those samples. So we wanted to use that non-invasive method to determine the effects of high air temperature um, on fecal glucocorticoid metabolites in this species. What we expected was that as air temperatures increases, as Tmax increases, we were going to see an increase in FGCM concentrations, indicating that the birds were responding physiologically to air temperature, to high air temperatures as a stressor. So what we did was we caught birds, brought them into our research facility where we can control air temperature, humidity, and light intensity on an hourly basis. We separated the birds into, into three groups so that we could have three different temperatures. For the cool treatment, Tmax was 32 degrees. For the moderate treatment, Tmax was 37 degrees. And for the hot treatment, Tmax was 42 degrees. We kept the birds in captivity for about 12 weeks, giving them two weeks of acclimat uh, to acclimatize to the environment, and then we collected weekly and we collected weekly um, dropping samples. These samples were then analyzed using tetrahydrocorticosterone, which is an enzyme immunoassay that has been validated specifically for use in this species. Once this was done, we collected all of the data and then um, we um, log transformed it because it was not normally distributed. Sorry, it was not normally distributed. And then we fitted it in a linear mixed model, um, in a linear mixed model with Tmax and Wix in captivity as predictor, um, as predictor of, um, sort of as predictors, and then bird ID as our random effect. So what did we find? 
Interestingly, or shockingly, depending on how you look at it, we found no responses to high air temperatures. So there was no relationship between FGCMs and TMEX. So um, as if you look at this figure here, you will see that we have maximum daily air temperatures um, in degrees Celsius and the x-axis, and then we have FGCM concentrations um, in micrograms per grams of dry fecal powder on the y-axis. So what we expected was that as air temperatures increase, we would see an increase of FGCM in FGCM concentrations. However, um, in this um, situation, we saw no difference in FGCM concentrations, which was baffling. Fortunately for me, because this freaked me out a little bit, was that, is that as I was doing my PhD, we had a BTEC student, Lisedi, who was analyzing data from um, data collected from free ranging bubblers. There is a, this is a population of, of bubblers, the one that Mandy Ridley was talking about, population of, of bubblers that are ringed so we can individually identify um, birds and they are also um, habituated to having researchers around them so we are able to follow them around and collect poop samples as they poop and um, then we record this information um, so the poop was collected from this individual at this time of day and this was the temperature. So then um, Lisedi analyzed the, these samples and they showed what we had expected to see in the lab. When, you, uh, when birds experience high temperatures, they increase FGCM concentrations. So if you look at this figure over here, you see we have daily maximum air temperatures on the x-axis, and then we have FGCM concentrations on the y-axis. And as air temperature increases, there's also an increase in FGCM concentrations. Um, and then if you look at this closely, you realize that as we get to about 38 degrees, this um, increase becomes um, sharp. So there's a sharp increase after 38 degrees, indicating that the birds actually do respond to high air temperatures or high TMEX as a stressor, um, as a stressor, which we did not see in the lab. So then we had to try and figure out why we were unable to see this in the lab. So the first step to doing that for us was um, plotting the data from the free ranging birds with the data from the capt captive birds. And as you can see in this figure over here, the, um, the, the, the data from the free ranging birds shows that FGCM concentrations in free ranging birds were significantly lower than uh, FGCM concentrations in captive birds. So what we are seeing here, which is important, is that southern pied bubblers do actually respond physiologically to high air temperatures, particularly at, temp at um, this significant um, response we see at temperatures above or at Tmax above 38 degrees. But this does not happen in captivity. So this suggests that captivity or the stress associated with um, capture, transportation and confinement in captivity was so great that the birds mounted their sort of maximal stress responses to these stressors, such that when we introduced the new stressor in the form of high air temperatures, the birds were just unable to give us anything else. They had reached their limit. Of course, when we look at data from um, Emma's um, honors project, we sort of find support for this because this suggests that captivity is a significant stressor for these birds. So here you will see um, this figure from Emma's um, honors project. Um, birds in captivity had significantly higher FGCM concentrations than free ranging birds. And these birds were sampled sort of from the same um, populations that um, Lisedi worked with. So we now know that we can get interesting information using this non-invasive method. Um, just, just to share another sort of interesting point before I move on to the conclusion of my study. So we also, so we, so here we are looking for most sort of been talking about, we've been looking at FGM, um, FGCMs in response to high air temperatures. We also found when we're doing um, Emma's project that we can actually look at the social structure of these birds or the energy requirement of each social sort of status um, in this in these groups. So we know that baseline glucocorticoid concentrations are going to be higher for individuals that are involved in energetically demanding um, um, positions or activities. So what we see here is that dominant males have higher baseline FGC con FGCM concentrations, suggesting that they spend a lot more energy in maintaining their dominance than the other individuals in the group, which again is an interesting thing to find. So we are learning a lot using this method, but it seems um, that if our data is going to be biologically relevant, it needs to be collected from free ranging individuals as captivity seems to hinder or 
seems to alter some of the results. Now, this is a challenge, especially when you work with small animals like birds. One, um, they're small, some of them will produce the smallest poop you've ever seen, and also they tend to fly. So sometimes they um, poop while they're up in the air, sometimes they poop while they're, they're on a tree, and sometimes even on the ground, and you can't actually find the sample that you're looking for. So as mentioned earlier, I am interested in um, finding out how these birds and other vertebrates generally respond to our changing environment. And I would like to do this in the least invasive way possible. And I think this is a way that would work. But I have sort of um, run into a hurdle where I need to figure out how we can collect samples non-invasively, um, but also ensuring that we are collecting um, appropriate samples. We are collecting samples from individuals that we can identify. So this is, this is where I am a little stuck right now and I'm open to ideas and options and, and anything really, um, I would appreciate that. Um, I think this is where I'm going to um, end today. I would like to thank all of you for your time. Thank you very much, Salive. A really great and very important talk. I would also like to use already now the opportunity to thank all three presenters of today for giving us such interesting, fascinating talks, also on a very broad range of topics. I think all of us learned a lot from many different things. So thank you very much to, to all three of you. It was really um, um, a pleasure to listen to you. And now we will first have like for the others three questions um, for Salive, and then we open a discussion that you can ask any one of the three presenters from today. But first, um, we have a question from Kaya for um, Salive. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I'm Kaya Tomback. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Hunter College. Um, I had to collect a lot of poop for my PhD from zebras and it was in a grassland environment and sometimes the grass was quite tall. Um, and you'd expect for something like the size of a zebra to be fairly easy to, you know, <laughs> just follow along and estimate the distance and go, but actually we would lose track of how far it was from the car very soon after it left um, and it would be hard to find the poop. So one trick that we tried and that worked quite well was that we would take a photo immediately when we saw them pooping. I don't know how quickly it happens with your birds, but take a photo so that you can go back to it in your camera and then you know use reference points of where it was um, to try to locate the poop. And then also before moving, um, if you have a range finder, uh, you can take the distance um, from where you are to where the animal is or something close by to the animal um, and just note that um, in your notebook. So then you have, um, you can get much closer to the poop at least to, to do your search. <laughs> um, we found that that worked quite well. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think it's it's something worth 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 looking into because some birds are going to leave sort of a decent sized poop. So you can actually, um, if you sort of have the general idea of where it is, then you can collect it. But others, um, as Drongos have shown me in the past couple of years, will leave the smallest thing you've ever seen, and that would really be difficult. But yeah, I really appreciate the the ideas and yeah. Thank you. Okay, then I have the liberty to ask um, a question. Um, you show there's a huge stress response when you take these birds in um, captivity. You Nobody know, will doubt that this is really a stress response compared to the field. The levels are so much higher. Uh. Now, my question is, um, an increase of glucocorticoids, um, the physiological function is to increase energy expenditure to overcome a stressor. Uh -huh. Why would you... And, to increase energy expenditure also is metabolism, so it creates heat. It warms up the, the individual. One would could ask you, why would you why did you predict that heat leads to an increase of glucocorticoids and as such an increase of energy expenditure and maybe even more heat up? Why did, I might have predicted the opposite that it should decrease to spend less energy when it's hot. 
Well, I don't know. I think birds are generally weird things because, I mean, we, we are looking at um, bubblers and bubblers use panting as a heat dissipating st strategy. And that is also something that actually increases heat production. So um, I'm not really sure why they would choose to use that strategy to dissipate heat, but it's something that happens. So I think we just sort of went with the general um, animals respond to stress physiology um, or stress um, stressful situations by um, increasing FGCMs or increasing glucocorticoids in their circulation. And that is actually something that we, de we do see in the, what you might call it, that is something we do see in the free ranging um, birds. So it must have um, a positive sort of effect, I would think. It must help them um, deal with the high temperatures. Okay. Uh, but of course, compared to the captive effect, it's very small, but it can be simply yeah. energy to, to, to have be, be energy for behavior to avoid the heat. I don't know. Maybe okay. That's so we think another more. reason why the stress to captivity was so high is because the birds, um, remember, it's a social species, but in order to be able to know who pooped where, we had to separate them. So if you look at one of the papers that sort of the recommended reading for today, um, Emma Jepson's paper, you will see that when we did the ACTH challenge situation, Situation, you actually see two peaks because um, there was actually a response to being an initial initial response to being separated from the group members. So we think there the, the might there might also be um, contributions from that from the fact that they are now forced to in, forced to sit in different cages. So while they could hear each other and see each other, they could not cuddle together. So that may have also contributed to the um, very high responses. Yes. Good. Then we have a question by a comment by Clara. Hi. Um, my my question was answered. I just wanted to know whether or not um, this particular species lived in groups, because a lot of babblers do live in groups. But I didn't know the species. Um, to relate it again to social behavior um, and social evolution, do you think that um, group structure, solitary versus group living, would make a difference? Um, <laughs> I think there's, there's a bit of contradictory data to that. Um, okay, so um, during Mandy's talk, she actually talked about how these birds try as much as possible to maintain their group structure, even when, um, even during years where, do not, where they do not successfully breed. I think she actually um, mentioned how they go and kidnap chicks from other um, groups just to ensure, to ensure that they um, maintain their group structure. However, um, a study done by, I hope I'm getting this right. Well, I hope I'm getting the results right. But a study done by Amanda Bourne, who is also a part of the Babla project, um, sort of found that the, 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 the group size or the social um, structure of the whole thing does not actually buffer them from the effects of, you know, high temperatures. I just don't remember whether she was looking at breeding or non-breeding birds. So I'm not quite sure. They seem to prefer being in groups, though. That's great. Um, just, I didn't say my name. I'm Clara B. Jones. So thank you all for the talks. Thank you so much. And we have a question by Maren Hook. Yeah, my name is Maren. I'm at the University of Derby. And um, yeah, thanks to all three of you. All three talks were great, really great. Um, and um, I'm, I'm probably going to direct some students to some of the to, uh, some aspects in various lectures in the future. Um, my my question is a question rather a uh, well sort of a relating to what Kaya said, are there any insects that go for the for the feces? Because that's how we, for, for tiny monkey poop, so small monkeys, we found them often because the flies would, or the beetles would come down and hover over them. And then we saw the insects rather than, than the poop. So would that be anything that would be possible for birds? I'm, I'm not sure whether they have as an attractive 
I am not too sure, but it would be an interesting thing to look into. I mean, it's it's something you can easily look at while you're doing other things in the field. And then we can see if it's something we could potentially um, do. Thank you so much for the idea. Thank you. Okay, so now we I open the discussion for all the three talks we had today. If you have a question for Standive, put an S behind the question mark for CPRT and C for Saliva. I know these, it's fascinating. We had so three very diverse talks, but I hope you're all, um, so it's maybe a bit difficult to jump between topics, but I think we should still be able to do that. And I will start with asking a question that has been asked on, um, on YouTube for um, Stan Dive, Petro Leote asks, did you observe any kind of trade-offs for the symbionts? And of a quick follow-up from an applied perspective, would there be a way to knock out the symbionts? I think, this, so is there any trade-offs for the symbionts? And would it be possible to knock them out, Stan Dive? Uh, yes, actually. So what we had shown as well is that there is a cost of the symbiosis. So while it is beneficial, what actually happens is that because the host has to invest so much resources to increasing the symbiont population so that they can deliver these amino acids, it's actually an investment from the nutritional side, even from the host. And so they delay reproduction. So what we see is that while the symbiotic beetles are doing so well, um, they have a thicker cuticle, they um, are well defended against predators, but they have had to uh, delay reproduction to increase the symbiont titer. Um, and so the aposymbiotic beetles actually start to lay eggs uh, at an earlier stage than the symbiotic beetles. But also it's been shown, I think in the ants as well, that the symbiosis pro is a cost um, immune wise because when they have the symbionts, um, they are actually more susceptible to infection. And we think that this is because if you have, if you have to tolerate um, a bacteria, then you have to sort of downregulate your immune system so that you're able to tolerate this infection. And on the one hand, you have these beneficial symbionts, but on the other hand, then this means that uh, opportunistic pathogens can also infect you. So there is somewhat of that trade-off um, in terms of the symbiosis. And the other question is for application. So we are able to remove the symbionts uh, either by heat treatment because the bacteria cannot tolerate such a very high uh, temperature or by direct antibiotic um, treatment. And what we've also recently been observing is that some uh, pharmacological uh, compounds can inhibit directly the shikimate pathway of the bacteria and therefore lead to the elimination of these symbionts. Uh, so yeah. Thank you. And a question by Maren for Zepi. Um, yeah, again, as I said, all three talks were great. Um, you, when you mentioned this barrier, uh, um, yeah, barrier behavior by the um, by some of the workers, um, uh, if I understood correctly, you thought that it's the first time that you saw it. I, I seem to remember to have watched um, David Attenborough. Uh, um, uh, um, film on mole rats, uh, naked mole rats, where they they did film actually how they block, where where they, the fattest essentially block the the tunnels so that snakes can't get in. Um, are you aware of that? Or um... hi, um, so the the I know there's a solitary species that's been documented and recorded to create a salt plug. I do not know about this David Attenborough documentary. That's so cool. That footage sounds amazing. Um, if you could please provide me with the title, that's something I'd really love to see. And it would help. At least now we have a quantitative measure of the behavior. And it's really cool that they have um, the footage for it as well. Thank you so much. I, I will that's try exciting. to find it and, and then send you the title of the thing because, I, yeah, I, I'll try to find it. Oh, that's exciting. Thank you. <laughs> then Lauren has a question for all three of you. So thanks to all three of you. Those incredibly interesting talks, um, remarkable. And um, I commend you all. And again, thanks to Carson for organizing this great thing. Um, 
I, I'm not sure how to even word my question. It comes entirely from naivety, I think. And I was trying, I guess the question to you is asking all three of you, and maybe I'll follow up a little bit of thought on that. Do you see links between your work? And the reason I asked that is because I was thinking about like microbiota, for example, I'm starting to understand that there might be a link to the brain from the microbiota. And if hot conditions are really messing with the stress physiology pathways, are those going to influence or be influenced by the microbiota and therefore affect the behavior? So I basically gave you a comprehensive exam, I guess, but it's just so many, I don't even know how to word the question, at, but do you see any of these connections as you're reading and conducting your work? Um, yes, definitely, especially with the microbiota kind of situation. So there's there's been a lot of talk on how, um, especially with the metrics that I'm planning to and trying to use for quantifying um, glucocorticoids, which is um, dropping samples. And we know that vertebrates have a lot of interesting things in their gut. So um, the, the, the glucocorticoids themselves actually can affect um, an, a, 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 a bird's sort of gut environment, and that will affect the metabolites that come out in the end. So there's definitely connections there. And um, the fact that Zepi and I are supervised by the same person probably means we are linked somehow. Mm. <laughs> um, I will also agree with Lily, where I definitely see um, space for the microbiota work, especially with the naked. Um, they do uh, copy they eat each other's poop. I forgot the technical name for that. And um, it is plausible to me that it's for the gut microbiota within the species passing from between each other. And that would be a really cool thing to see. And um, some of the responses we did see were stress responses, stress behavior responses. So yeah, I see that link as well. Yeah, I guess um, uh, an emerging, or well, not really emerging, but a lot of people seem to be working also on the link between symbiosis and behavior. Um, and for insects, it's been shown, for example, I, I like that you mentioned the gut microbiota, I mean, the um, consuming of feces, which is usually a way that um, many animals use to obtain uh, the gut microbiota from the previous generation. It's not the case necessarily in our system because of the vertical transmission directly via the egg, but in a lot of other species, it's this horizontal transmission from the environment. And so the previous generation have to leave the microbiota there. And then insects then engaging in behaviors that can either limit um, other pathogens that are coming into the environmental space. Um, and this is, for example, maybe uh, if you've seen the fine of the work of Peter Biedermann, how these microbes then influence also um, the behavior influencing the evolution of sociality in some beetles. So there's definitely um, always a link. And I think I am generally interested in anything that sits at the intersection of behavior and symbiosis, because I think that's like really cool topics. So yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Very fascinating stuff. No, I think there is, must be clear links between um, gut microbes stress, brain, behavior, personality. So, and it's nice here to see, and it's thanks Lauren for bringing this up to see that even though these talks are very, very diverse, they, they, do, they do fit um, together. Then Sulema has a question for CP. Yeah, I, I want to, well, first of all, I'm Sulema Tang Martinez at the University of Missouri in St. Louis, I'm retired. And first I wanna say that I thought all three talks were just wonderful and extremely interesting. And I'm so glad, Karsten, that you organized this type of uh, seminar today. Um, my question for Seppi, um, I, I realized, and, and you might have said this and I missed it, but I realized that you found correlations in, in the scores that the mole rats had um, across the, I think it was seven days that you tested them. So you could reliably, um, you know, you could reliably correlate within, for example, for boldness or for exploration. What, I, what I'm not sure 
I heard is whether you also found correlations between the different tests. In other words, were the same animals that were bold, that showed boldness in the boldness test, higher boldness, were they the same animals that also showed higher exploratory behavior and then how aggression fits into that? And then the other comment, which I'll make because otherwise I'll forget it, and this has to do with Maren's uh, question about um, the, uh, the mole rats um, essentially plugging up the tunnels uh, in the case of snakes. I do know that in, in other subterranean burrowing rodents, you do get that kind of behavior towards snakes very frequently. And I'm thinking specifically of prairie dogs. And in that case, in some cases, they actually, which I guess is sort of what you saw, they, I have seen them um, plug a tunnel that a snake went into that didn't have any other opening. And so I have seen prairie dogs actually, the snake goes into, into the burrow and the prairie dogs immediately uh, begin burying the snake in the burrow so that it doesn't, it can't get out. But that's just an observation that I wanted to point out. And I think, I think other ground squirrels do the same sort of thing, I'm pretty sure. But um, my question really is about that correlation question among the different um, measures of boldness, exploration, and aggression. Thank you for your question and your compliments. Um, we did see, uh, I, I excluded it from the presentation, um, but we did see a correlation, uh, a statistically significant correlation between exploration and boldness. So there is a behavioral syndrome in the dispersal moths, um, in the dispersal moths, and it was a positive correlation. So yes, there were animals which were bold were also the animals, were also most likely the animals that were explorative. Uh, with aggression, um, with both boldness and exploration, the correlation was not statistically significant. And I'm not entirely sure because you would think in the boldness exploration axes, they exist um, aggression. Um, but I think that's just because with the dispersers, they're not the most aggressive of the members. And there is a possibility if applied to the rest of the colony that we will see, um, we will see the aggression as well being part of the axes. Um, with the peritox, that's really, really cool. Yes, uh, we, we do see that this is a behavior that's seen in subterranean mammals. Um, so except for the David Attenborough um, documentary, this, uh, this hasn't, hadn't been recorded yet in the nakeds. But yeah, I think it's a cool strategy. I didn't know the peri dogs buried the snakes. <laughs> it's kind of funny, yeah. but I, I imagine it's effective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have seen it at least on two occasions. And in one case, I, I actually dug out the snake because I wanted to measure it. And, make sure I identified it correctly and so on. It was a huge snake and they totally buried it like in a matter of probably, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. The, the hole was just, you couldn't even tell there was a burrow there in the past. It was really quite astonishing. Yeah. And the, the, other, the other thought that just occurred to me, if I can go ahead and ask one more is, um, the, the other thing I find interesting is that in terms of the different um, uh, casts, if you want, in the naked mole rats, so you have the breeding pair, and then you have the workers, and then you have the disperser morph. Um, but what I find interesting, and this may be something worth looking at in terms of the endocrinology that, if I remember correctly, you, you said you were really interested in, is that presumably those dispersers will, if they're able to found a new colony, they themselves will become the new breeders, right? And so it will be interesting to know like, 
endocrinologically what occurs during that process of going essentially from a disperser morph, which is usually thought of as a worker morph, to then being able to become a breeder in the new colony. No, it's, yeah, that would be really cool to look at and a kind of before and after being a breeding, a breeding member of a colony. I know they are reproductively suppressed by the queen. So all the workers, they are reproductively viable, but they are suppressed by the queen through mechanisms that are not fully understood yet or I don't fully understand yet, yeah. but yes, it would be really cool to see that, yeah. Yeah. So thanks very much. Well, then I have um, one comment and two questions for Zepi. The first comment is, it's nice if David Attenborough filmed something like this and then Sulema observed something like this, but it's also very important that results and observations like this get published. So even those people here say, okay, I heard of something like this, I would really encourage CP to, to write a very nice paper about this barrier behavior and that it is really available for everyone in the literature. I think that is um, quite, quite important. Um, then I have two methodological questions. Maybe you answer during your talk, but I'm always busy with other things too. I'm not listening carefully enough maybe. Um, for your aggression test with the novel pod, um, I guess there was a barrier between the stranger and the other animal. And then what, what, what did you actually measure? It's the first methodological question. The second one is always a question with personality. Why did you test them on five different days? How did you choose five and not three or two or, or something like that? Uh, thank you for your question. And thank you for the encouragement. We'll definitely get to work on the... Um, publication um, with the with the con specific test yes you are right in that there was a barrier so it was a wire mesh between the two individuals and they could smell each other but they couldn't touch each other um, the behaviors we did select um, one of them was gnawing so they would go at the um, at the wire mesh, there were instances where I had to hold it down and I get bitten in the process as well. <laughs> so uh, we did have the um, knowing behaviors and a few others that contributed to that. And I think, sorry, I forgot your second question or the second why, part. Why did you choose to test them on five different days and not three or four or two, or why five? Um, so we wanted to, Initially, we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure that the behaviors were consistent over time, but we weren't sure about what kind of time period would work best. So that's why we just decided, because initially what we we're doing, we were designing this with a bigger idea, with a bigger idea to apply this in, to a colony setting. So initially we chose one, three, five, and seven days after just in case they needed a seven day period break or a three day period break in case after one day, they still remember the colony setting and it wouldn't be reliable to do the second test after one day. And that's why we did um, the, different, the different frequencies. I hope that addresses your question. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. Then Lauren has a question for Saliba. Yeah, before I ask my question, uh, again, uh, I think this has been a major success. And I wanted to just say to um, the people here, I've emailed some of you already about establishing a, another one of these for Latin American scientists. So following Carson's lead on this important endeavor. So for those of you I email, emailed on this, and I see a couple of you here, I know I sent it to you. If you know someone, please let us know, because we're going to try and do this in the spring. Um, so my question is, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, you were showing them, they were, it was a gular fluttering that they were doing the birds in the heat stress or was it panting? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. No, you're not on mute, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear you either. Maybe it's something with a microphone.
No, still no. not. And I don't see a microphone sign at all. At your, it's like you don't have a micro. There's no microphone sign from you. Like you have no microphone. Where are you? I know there is one, but it says it should be on. If, can't be here if, if you click on the the little, the little hat next to the um, mute button, you might be able to switch your microphone. It's a little triangle next to it. Now you're on mute. No, try not. That's doesn't work no. now. <laughs> if you uh, there's the triangle next to the microphone. I don't know if there are options for different microphones. In the meantime, let me ask my question for I can email my questions to you later. In the meantime, I ask my question for Stambil. If, 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 if you make it work, then just scream in and we come back to you. So Stambil, I also have a very um, primitive question. In your talk, you clearly show the benefits to the Beatles for the symbionts. Um, and for the symbionts, the bacteria, I guess the benefit is simply that they can live within the beetles. What you also showed is that the beetles can live without the symbionts, even though they are impaired. Well, how is it with the bacteria? Are they totally, do they totally rely on the beetles or they can also live without them? Um, okay, so in the on the host side, these beetles can live without the the bacteria because they do get some trace amounts of these amino acids in the food um, that they might be able to use for that just minimal um, cuticle development, though it's impaired. Um, but in the case of the bacteria, actually, so this relationship, especially with the sawtooth grain beetle, which is the one where I did the predation essays, is actually very ancient. It's uh, millions of years old when the, the beetle ancestor then acquired the symbiont. And because of uh, reduced selection, on the bacterial population, on the bacteria themselves, they have uh, shown drastic genome reduction. And so now when we look at the genome itself, it doesn't encode for much else other than a few uh, housekeeping genes and also just doing specifically the tyrosine provisioning pathway. So in a way, they have just become enslaved to the beetle, if I may put it that way. They cannot at all survive outside, so they cannot survive as free living bacteria. They have to be inside the host in order to replicate and so now the, the benefit is for both the bacteria and the host mm -hmm. to be in this association. Okay, thank you. So the, the bacteria really have to rely on, on, the, on the beetles as, as a host. Good, then we come to Eduardo. I think he doesn't have a question, but he wants to announce the fine on the... Well, but only, only, only once. I just wanted to ask for a few minutes on that, but only after we are done with the questions uh, to our colleagues. And of course, I, I second everything that's been said. Karsten, you broke no ground. This has been fantastic, amazing, so well organized. Uh, you must be German. So, uh, but I can wait if there are other questions to our colleagues. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't do anything. I was only leaning back and listening. So it was sort of the pleasure for no, me. You, no, you did. I mean, for example, it was lovely to see, I mean, uh, connecting their talks to previous talks. I mean, imagine that people could go and go to the almost 70 presentations we have in fine and de develop even a small little course on a particular topic, drawing from them. Yeah, you did a lot. And brilliant. Uh, thank you. Then there is a comment from Marin uh, to um, to um, Zepi. I don't know, Zepi, have you seen that? There's a link. You want me to copy it and send it to you by email, just to make sure that you have you have it. Okay. Are you all, are you all responded? Sorry, I'm going step by step. Then Clara to everyone. Um, she also says it was a great. So, uh, so if there's nothing else. I, I mean, I just it's not a question. It's a comment. But I wanted to wait until now when we are. Or as a family, relax. So, so the reason I was mentioning uh, Valentin Andrein 
uh, who's going to be talking on November 18th, uh, we, st we still have an empty slot, you find, October 18th. And I'm sharing this with you because many of you are always a regular attendee, so fine. And, and they, you guys stay for our conversations after. So I am, um, I haven't said it yet because I, I don't want to overcommit, but in my mind, I can share with you. I'm really hoping to put something together for October 18th that will be intellectually connected to what Valentin Ambre will be presented on November. It's November 8th, right? His talk is November 8th, October 18th is the open one. What is the issue that has come up a few times over a, during five meetings? That after seven decades of struggling, there is now what I think it's hopefully a, the final move to really stop using statistical significance in evolution of biology at large, animal behavior included. Valentin Arred is leading, he's one of the leaders of that movement. That's why I'm sharing with you his website. He was delighted that we invited him because so much of his work on this topic has been done with epidemiologists. And so he's delighted that he's just got a paper published in the Journal of Evolutionary Biology asking us for us to stop uh, doing significance testing and focus on estimation of uncertainty. Uh, but what I invite you, please email me. Uh, this has come up in the past. We've discussed it with Nancy Solomon. I have it because she's the editor of Animal Behavior. There are a number of people that I'm talking to. If you want to reach out to me via email with ideas. If you want to help me think how we can use the October 18th. It can, it can just be that maybe we won't have a presentation. We'll just have a little bit of a round table. Maybe we'll exchange ideas. Maybe we'll open up with some of the things that Valentin will cover on November 8th. One of the very, very uh, thought provoking ideas he has in that paper is he's saying, listen, 99% of all the research we do is descriptive. Most of us cannot put together a properly developed hypothesis that focuses on process because we just don't know enough about our systems, right? We all suffer from that. What are we gonna do? So he has no answers. So I just wanted to leave you with these comments because you're part of the community, the final community, email me, I continue to uh, add to a list I have the names of people who want to understand maybe first why statistical significance needs to be retired from observational research and most of experimental research and then what because what we're finding among many colleagues young and not so young is that it brings panic okay but if I don't do that you got if I don't let R decide where this is important or not, what the heck do I do? Am I supposed to be the one? Yes, we are supposed to be the ones deciding if the findings are important or not, cannot be done by a machine. But that's, that's scary. It, it's moving the responsibility to us. That's one point, the other one is that I must give to you as everyone, I've done it. I mean, just browse my papers, I've done it all along. I'm just trying to change, so. Uh, let me know. That's I'll stop. But definitely, definitely look forward to talking to you. If you want to have a chat one-on-one, -on -one, if you have ideas, uh, I'm trying to decide how to use this open slot to get us thinking, warm up, prepare for Valentin's seminar on November 8th. Eduardo, I think yes. if you do this, I think if you do this, one um, one interesting way to do it would be to have very short presentations, like maybe 10 minutes by um, this person you're talking about, and then have a 10 minute presentation by someone who doesn't agree or sees a value in keeping p-values. And then after that, opening up to discussion by everybody. Uh, thanks, I mean, you're doing what I need to be challenged, to throw ideas for, for us to ponder. Yes, we're thinking of brief presentations. In fact, one of the things that I'm thinking for October 18th is identify two or three of us. In fact, I'm thinking of some students and postdocs who are saying, okay, this is my problem, help me solve it. Because you're telling me to do that, 
I don't know where to go. Valentin wants to have a lot of conversation. Inviting somebody who doesn't agree and less willing to do, they, I mean, that train has left. If somebody doesn't agree, they need to point me at literature of the amount and magnitude that is speaking for retirement in favor of keeping it. So we cannot have, the, I mean, our, usually our criteria is, I mean, is whatever are our ideas approved by the community, either because they give you grants or they publish you or they give you jobs. We've come to the point where somebody has to tell me, just give me 10 papers in the last five years, defending statistical significance in observational research of the nature we do. And this is major point. Nobody's saying stop using the P. The problem is the binary, dichotomous, thoughtless, meaningless p-value that if it is 0.05, I've done amazing research, it is 0.052, does make it. So I think we need to put the weight of providing evidence to those who are not uh, jumping on this. And the fact that you cannot find papers, usually when we have a matter of debate, some people publish in support of one argument, some people publish in support of the other. I am left, I have not found, I don't, I don't come across that, but that would be something as well, you can help me. Do you find papers for observational research where the population is, when not, is not well defined, where we cannot manipulate conditions, where we cannot, right? I mean, our situation, I'm now talking, maybe if you're doing experimental psychology, experimental animal behavior in a control setting, there may be value, right? So I think we need to put the weight on those who, who, who are out of, I think it's out of not having time or just feeling, oh shit. I mean, I've been publishing for 20 years and I'm being told to reanalyze. Mm -hmm. Yes, that applies to my research. In fact, one of the things that I wanna do with those 10 minutes is use my own work to say what I did, I will not do again. Okay, sorry that I interrupt here, but I'm going to finish the YouTube screaming now. And also because CP still has um, two more meetings coming up in three minutes. So I would like to thank all the three presenters again for very nice um, talks and fascinating talks today. We, I think we were all very impressed and uh, we are all very in good spirits um, of, of the research you're doing and also that some of this research hopefully stays in, in Africa. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it was really, it was a really amazing opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. The same sentiments. That's what amazing. Right. What amazing. I want to say thank you, but can I behead? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and I do apologize for the technological issues. <laughs> that's that's part of, of the of the Zoom games. <laughs> yeah. So there may be, like you heard, there may be other interesting topics. It's always nice to have different forms of diversity in the fine, also that the uh, talks that are coming up by, by, by um, I'm, I'm Ryan, I'm about statistics and, and these topics we're always discussing again. Um, another person you could ask is of another former student from the Stripe Mouse Project, um, um, what's her name? Um, um, I, I, I sent you once the three article, we, we say all, what you said, the p-value is not useless, but you have to, to use, use it properly. So that would maybe be a, a, a counter thing. I can send you her email and maybe you can ask her, but I'm not around the 18th of October. Um, so now we will have to stop here now quite soon because CP still is meet. I mean, most of you know that we also have individual meetings um, from the file organizers with the with um, the presenters, and CP is still going to meet now. I think first Adriana, and then Annalise Berry. I didn't even see her today in the audience, but maybe she's still still coming. So thank you everyone for um, participating today and hope to see all of you um, again next week if you, if, if you do have, have time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you everyone. For putting this together. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Sorry, I will just leave. What's happening? Okay. First time we use the other link, right? Is it?
Is it the same link or is it a different one? It's really stay here. It's supposed to be the same link. Okay, good. I didn't, I, I wasn't sure if it was the same link or not. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, like I said to you, I didn't see Annalise Barry today or in the audience, but maybe because I think she's on the best coast. It could be that she watched online and that, that she's Annalise? She was coming. She was in the audience earlier. She was okay. Maybe it was yeah. so many people I didn't see it, but then maybe she comes back because she's on the west coast. I think she's at UC Davis or something like that. Or where is she? Uh, I forgot. So, Sebi, I'm okay. going to make you now the host of of this okay. um, of this Zoom meeting. That means okay. you can control everything. It, Do you I know? So it's still, it's still streaming on YouTube. I think, oh, is it? Yeah. Is it still? Why? I thought I stopped it. Ugh. I made you host now, and no, I can't even stop it anymore.